Hi, this is Paul Gordon Collier, and I'm here to talk about, well, I guess I'll call it the introduction, the theoretical possible introduction to a theoretically possible philosophy that I'm working on called Apex Existentiality. And you will note that I have a script here that I'm going to go along with so that I can keep my thoughts uh, in line and perspicacious, if you will. And I also have up above here, I have a graph, which we may or may not get to. But I'm going to leave the graph up there and you can ponder that graph as you're, as you're listening to me. And hopefully, maybe as you're listening to me, maybe some of the graph will begin to make some sense to you, even if I don't get to it. And if I don't, there will be a part two in which I'll actually go over the graph. So we're going to start with Action Batsa, the path to authentic apex existentiality, which could end up being the title of a book that I may or may not someday, someday write. We'll see. So we're going to start off with the first section here. You are compelled to take action that benefits you and you alone. All notions of altruism and self-sacrifice are myths. They're lies that we tell ourselves mostly to appease our ego's diminished sense of power to fully live outside, well, out in the world. It's a form of well, I'm going to call it uh, Stockholm Syndrome. And you remember what Stockholm Syndrome, I'm sure many of you remember Stockholm Syndrome. It's when you are being held hostage, you develop a sympathy for your, for your hostage takers and that you may actually turn to be on their side and you may actually end up helping them even though they are holding you hostage. It's kind of like that. So when Master constrains you, you have two choices to avoid the death of ego, which leads to the death of self in all sense of that word. And I mean spiritually, all of it, physically, all of it. You can seek to end the master's power over you, or you can find justifications for continuing to operate without power to be the master over others, that we all desire to be. And this is in Stockholm Syndrome. You will find a way to enter into a frame in which your diminishment is not actually your diminishment, but it serves some noble end, the noble cause of, of the one that's captured you. So if you reject both choices, you end in the third choice, to die whether through suicide or madness, and I'm defining madness as the departure from potential coexistential per, per, uh, perceptuality. So by that I mean that you are entering into a perceptive world that does not align with the people around you, so you can't effectively cooperate with them or engage with them or have consensual or even coercive interaction with them. As you begin to perceive that your options to carry out choice one to end the master's authority or power by replacing it with your own, you slip into the latter, the formation of justifications for being a diminished ego unable to fully live out its authentic self. And I do want to say that the word authentic here is possibly, and I'm, I, I, su I support that it is, it's possibly an unobtainable. <laughs> there, is, there is no, a, a, at its root, there is no authentic self because there is no self that is stopped in time. And, well, I'll get into that. But in essence, uh, the, the authentic self is, is more of of a striving towards rather than an achievable goal. But still, in your, within your ego, you are seeking to live out your authentic self as in your fulfillment of your ego. So at this point here, what you have is in the beginning, 
Well, it sounds kind of like I'm going down a nihilistic path in a, in a sense where I'm saying that there is no there is no altruism. There is there is there is no hope. But uh, don't worry, I'm not going to leave you at the door of just checking my thing here. I'm not going to leave you at the door of nihilism. So stay with me if if at this point you're you're a little bit thinking hmm. Well, this is nihilism. No, it's not. Hopefully you'll see that. So there are a number of ways that we go about accepting our master's constraints. We can transfer our ego pursuits to the ego pursuit of our master, making our enslavement to the master's will a proof of the successful living out of the master's ego, which becomes our ego, in extension, through the role we play as servants to the master in making their egos triumph true. So in the case of, you know, the bank robber situation, they have, maybe they're, they have, you know, we're doing it for the poors. We're going to rob from the rich and steal from the poor. And now you're part of their narrative. And you want to be part of the narrative. They give you, just, if they give you just the smallest reason to enter into their narrative, their frame, their, their ego, then you willingly you pull at it because you can't face the diminishment of your own ego. You're captured. There's not much you can do. Their, your life is in their hands, and your ego can't take that. So rather than facing that, then you become enamored with their cause, and their cause becomes your cause, and you are no longer a captive, although you still are. Just try and walk away and see what happens. You're no longer a captive, but rather you are a a consensual participant, even though you're not. We can diminish our ego's potential verticality so that we can achieve some level of ego extension that is nested within the constraints our master places on us. So the 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 verticality is is the up and down. And so we, we diminish the height of our potential verticality by creating a new ego goal that is nested within the height that our master will allow us to take. Now, this is not, this is, well, I, I guess Stockholm Syndrome, you can see this, but uh, this isn't necessarily the Stockholm Syndrome model. This is, this is, uh, well, this would be, in in the case of of a coercive minded religion let's just say uh that you have been told by your priest king or priest or whoever that there is this certain level that if you uh, that if you strive towards a height higher than theirs that you're in sin or the gods will be mad or whatever and so you accept that uh, limitation on your verticality because if you don't accept the limitation on that verticality, then you have your ego has to face the fact that fundamentally that it is diminished and it cannot achieve attain to the highest heights. We can find lesser slaves through which we can execute our ego's master pursuit on the world, even if it is nested within the limitations our master places on us. So we can find the lesters to be masters over. We can create our own little master slave universes within uh, like the, 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 the cliched, the police officer who, well, I mean, police officers, they go out into the world and they got all kinds of, of bosses over them. And they're called to ostensibly, perceptively, whether they do or not, put their lives at risk and, they're called ostensibly to be the servants of, you know, protect and serve and all that. And it's a diminishment of their ego in that it caps what they're allowed to do and what they can't do. And then you have amongst police officers, it seems to be a high percentage compared to other, most other type of populations, uh, I'll say vocational populations, seem to be a lot of spousal abuse at home, a lot of and I'm not saying the majority of police officers, are, I don't mean like that, I just mean in proportion to other groups. I'm not saying the majority of police officers are going home and abusing their spouses, but they create their own authoritarian uh, constructs at home where they get to execute 
their ego that they're not able to execute when they're out there in 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 service to to their their real masters they they most assuredly are directly uh, aware maybe like me possibly like no other vocation they are directly aware of the limitations that the law the master and his law ha- has over their lives so we can create the is that we can be and that can, that can be we so the is that can be we that is whatever we sense the the well, I won't get into, I won't try to, I don't want to get ahead of my definitions here, and I almost did there, but I'm not going to. So let's just stick stick to this. We can create the is that we can be, and that can be we. And on the other side, this is, this is the is that we can enter into, that we can align with. And the is that cannot be we, and that we cannot be. Now that... I'm calling the other, the is that can be, and the is that 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 can be we is the non-self that we could potentially become, and and it conversely can become us, and then the well, I got a little ahead of myself there. Yeah. Oh well, uh, you'll get to that, <laughs> I'm, and I'll get to that because I'm I'm pointing to that to that to that terminology, non-selfness, and that we cannot be the other. So once you become the other. We do this so that coercion is justified without diminishing our ego. As we are not executing coercion as a means of control, but as a means of defense against non-selfness, whose mere being is a threat to our own existentiality. We largely do a combination of all four, and from the pattern from this pattern emerges the cycles of violence that have dominated our human civilizing experience. And so we can go back here and we have the first part is we transfer our ego pursuit onto the the master. So we are able to accept a diminished capacity because we're serving a larger ego that we are we're taking in a, in, a, in essence we are perceptively not actually taking ownership of the master's ego so that the master's ego is our own and that our diminishment is uh is is fine because the diminishment is for the for the purpose of serving out the higher ego we can diminish our ego's potential verticality so there what we do is we essentially we just lessen our expectations <laughs> If you want to be the greatest football player of all time and you soon learn that you are not cuz 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 your master in this case is is your physical abilities as recognized by the non-selves and if you are able to execute and become the greatest football player perceptively whether you are or not is is irrelevant uh then you'll continue but if you are not then you will have to adjust your phys- football ego <laughs> So that instead of striving towards being the greatest football player of our time, maybe it's just being a starter. And if it's not being a starter, maybe it's just being a good second stringer. And if it's not a second stringer, then maybe it's just doing the best you can within your limited physical capacity. And then we can find lesser slaves through which we can execute our ego's master pursuit. So in this third option, we will essentially create kind of a, a a scaled down world that we can actually put ourselves at the top of so that's what we're doing in there and then finally we can we can create an excuse to basically use coercion which well I'll get to it but we're going to use coercion as a means of achieving our apex existentiality and our, 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 I'm going to say our, I'm sorry, I'll get to that. We're getting to that. Uh, I'll say ego for right now to, to achieve our, our own self ego uh, without losing our sense of our ego being diminished because we have taken coercive action against the non self. And I'll explain why that's a problem coming up. So we largely do a combination of all four, and from this pattern emerges cycles of violence that have dominated our human civilizing experiment. And I think that when I do write the book at this point, I may 
not go forward until I give maybe a few historic examples. I'm not sure about that, but what I might end up doing is I might ex include, I can think of three examples off the top of my head that may I, I may use to, to illustrate this. And one would be the the rise of uh, of the Aztecs, and one would be the 1381 Peasants Revolt, and a third one would be the creation of the the Hittite uh, city. Uh, let me make sure I get it right. I think it's Harappa. I think that's the name of the Hittite city. I could, I'm pretty sure that's it. So those three might be the examples that I use. That's what I have in my head right now. I might change it. It's not because they're necessarily... Well, I think they're very, I think they're great examples for various reasons, but they're not necessarily the best examples. But now we get on to the next section. Our masters are served by the perpetuation of habits of action, be it thought or deed. And I make no distinction between the two. They're both a form of action. So for me, thought is a form of action. And I want to make that very clear. But I... I, I will still sometimes say thought or deed or thought or action just because I understand most people are not framing understanding of action to extrapolate it to, to thought alone. So our masters are served by the perpetuation of habits of action, be it thought or deed, that reinforce our acceptance of the unsatisfied pursuit of our ego as a master over all other egos by creating diminished or vicarious expectations of our, and I'm using this word for the first time here, which I'll explain, apex existential potential. Or I could just say here for right now, ego potential. Maybe I'll change that to ego potential then. Because I, I don't I'm trying to walk you through an understanding of the terminologies that I will be later using extensively. And I'm trying to use terminologies initially that I feel like people can much more readily understand than the phraseologies that I'm ultimately going to be using. In coming to face to face with who you are, a self that serves only to satisfy self, a self that has no power or understanding to accomplish the supreme fulfillment of self, the supremacism of self's ego over all other egos, it is hoped you will come to see the self-serving utility of adopting a consensual lifestyle where the ego is nested within a master ego external to humanity altogether, such as an ideal not dependent on the power of any one or select number of individuals, such as living out the golden rule, or a model that exists outside of humanity through which you can live out your master ego through, such as Christ. And I will argue that is absolutely the, the most effective model in, in doing this. So uh, looking back here and coming face to face with who you are, a self that serves only to satisfy self. This is, this is I believe, this is mathematically, logically, physiologically, uh, psychologically, spiritual, all the way around this is an unavoidable truth about the nature of organisms in general. Organisms only act in their best interest. And where we, well, where we, we get into an issue with this is when you imagine a self that would commit suicide or a self that would sacrifice itself. Well, you can understand maybe perhaps the suicidal self because I just described if you enter into a frame with the world in which you see no potential for your ego to be satisfied, then you will experience some death, whether it's cognizant death or, or, or physical death. Uh, but what about the self that is willing to kill its uh, or sacrifice itself for others is it satisfying is it satisfying its pref is it is it is it pursuing its own self interest by ending its life yes and uh, hopefully I, I will get into showing that but just briefly it has to do with the nature of the pursuit there's various i'll just use the word ego for now there's various ego pursuits there's and not all of those ego pursuits are, are necessarily in the hierarchy of their, of their importance to your own ego. They're not always necessarily about preserving your 
temporal physiological life. There are, are higher ego satisfactions that uh, would allow you to, to end your own life and still be serving your best interest. And this, this is something that I believe is really crucial for human beings to get a grip on, to, to escape this notion that somehow that we are, we are not, that we are actually capable of not acting in our own best interest. Because unless and until you can free yourself from that presupposition, you will never get to anywhere close to the root of who and what you are or the root of who and what others are, especially as those others emerge in aggregate expressions. So I'm going to go back over this again because I think it's definitely, this is a very, very important part. In coming face to face with who you are, a self that serves only to satisfy self, a self that has no power or understanding to accomplish the supreme fulfillment of self, the supremacism of self's ego over all other egos, and this is an important thing here, on one hand, I want you to come to terms with the fact that you only act to satisfy yourself. That's all you do. Come to terms with that and, uh, the heck? I don't know what that was. Come to terms with that. And then in addition to that, because you don't just want to come to terms with the fact that the self only acts to satisfy yourself because you'll end up becoming, quote unquote, you'll become selfish. And selfish is when you're acting like a fool and you imagine that you can achieve this part, the supremacism of self's ego over all other egos. This is the part you must understand that you cannot ever achieve this. It is an illusory goal. It is, a, it is immediate illusory, nor can you achieve it through others. No other human being can do this. There's no human being on the face of the planet that will ever do this. No human being that you graft your ego onto will ever, ever be able to do this. So you must humble yourself in the realization that there is a master over you, whatever you want to call the master. The master is the physiological limitations, the, the psychological uh, whatever you want to call it the the limitations upon the reality of humanity is such that none of us none of us can achieve this it is hoped that you will come to see the self now you can achieve this in the sense that uh you can perceive that you are doing this but it's a lie it's always a lie it is hoped if you come to first that you only act in the interest of yourself, and two, that you have no power to achieve the height of your ego ambition, it is hoped you will come to see the self-serving utility of adopting a consensual lifestyle where the ego is nested within a master ego external to humanity altogether. So you graft yourself onto an ego, if you will, a master ego, if you will, and this is a, in essence, you could say this is a, an ideational ego, an e and and almost I think it almost has to be an ideational ego, something that exists outside the universe itself, being a creation itself. It has to be something outside of creation, outside of humanity, in order for you to have any hope of 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 moving towards a higher ego, and. I, I point out here, such as such as an ideal not dependent on the power of any one or select number of individuals, such as living out the golden rule or a model that exists outside of humanity through which you can live out your ma master ego through, such as Christ. And I believe, as I said earlier, Christ is absolutely, by far and in a way, the best the best model. My argument. I should add, the external principle must produce consensual exchange, and that's con key. If the external prin principle does not produce consensual exchange, you will end up in the civilizing pattern once again. And I'm not sure that I clarified what the, oh, I'm going to have to change that. So I don't know if I fully introduced the civilizing pattern. Okay. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll just word that differently here. It, it, else you will basically end up having to lie to yourself again. You will end up having to take coercive action against your neighbors, against 
well, you have to take coercive action. You'll have to, to produce an otherness so that you can coerce your neighbors to achieve your, your, your ego pursuit. So in both scenarios, it requires the self not be compelled to satisfy the pursuit of the supreme ego through coercive means as the self will be aware that such attempts are doomed to fail before they even begin to execute them. And thus the self-deception instantly begins as well. I just wonder if I'm missing something here or if I went over it and I didn't catch it here, but it seems like I'm missing a paragraph or something. Hmm. Because I'm still describing the the civilizing pattern. And the civilizing pattern... It basically it maybe it's up here. Let me see here. I want to make sure that uh, I'm I'm pinning all of these together. So our master or sir. Okay, here here is the civilizing pattern right here. Our masters are served by the perpetuation of habits of action, be it thought or deed, and I make those you well know, that reinforce our acceptance of the unsatisfied pursuit of our egos as masters over all other egos by creating diminished our vicarious expectations of our of our I'm going to say our ego pursuit. That is the civilizing pattern. That is where civilization has emerged from the ability of a small number of individuals to create what they need to create, these, these, these habits of action that, that allows us to walk in a diminished a, uh, ego pursuit that keeps our masters in their advantageous position over us. So in both scenarios, in both the civilizing pattern and the this this other pattern, which I'm not going to give a name to yet, hint, it's apex existentialism. In both scenarios, it requires the self not be compelled to satisfy the pursuit of the supreme ego through coercive means, as the self will be aware that such attempts are doomed to fail before they can even begin to execute them. And your self knows. Yourself knows what, what, and when I say self, uh, I, the self is a moving target. There, there is no, there is no static self. The self is a dynamic, uh, I emerging, if you will. Uh, but such as that is, that self, that self understands fully the moment that you have to lie to yourself in pursuit of, of your ego. So, in both scenarios, it requires the self not be compelled to satisfy the pursuit of the supreme ego through coercive means, as the self will be aware that such attempts are doomed to fail before they can even begin to execute them. And thus, the self-deception instantly begins as well. Once you start the self-deception, then you have to start creating others because you're going to have to take coercion, course of action against them. And coercion as a means of satisfying the apex existential, and yes, the apex existential and the ego, uh, this is, ego does not perfectly describe apex existentiality, but it is, it is the gateway into understanding what apex existentiality is, and, and it's, it's certainly, a, it's a good synonym, even if it's not an exact match. Uh, but it's, it's close enough. Coercion as a means of satisfying the apex existential is self-refuting. Coercion requires more coercion, and coercion is a reflection of self's diminished master ego. In that, it, and I think what I'm going to have to do is I'm going to, have to go through here and change these apex existentials that are here because I do get to it here. Uh, I'm going to, have to change those to egos because I don't want to use them until I get to it. But you know, in this presentation. It is what it is. Coercion requires more coercion, and coercion is a reflection. It's kind of like lies beget lies. And coercion is a reflection of self's diminished master ego in that it is an admission that your inherent ego qualities are not sufficient in and of themselves to affect the will, the action of others. See, this is ultimately what you need to, what you're, what you're, 
what your body needs, I'll say for right now, what your body needs in order to give you your internal rewards. And you'll understand that a little bit more a little later. What your body needs to give you the internal rewards is a sense that your your ego is being satisfied, their master ego. And in order to do that, you have to perceive that 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 the non self that is reflecting reflecting to you perceptively your master ego is doing so consensually not 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 cooperatively not coercively but consensually it's obvious that you are the master ego the supreme ego if there were such a thing and i would argue the only supreme ego is the ego of god the father the son and the holy spirit does not rule coercively its rulership is the reality of power itself like the laws of physics that are true and just regardless of any effort to contradict their truths. Gra gravity will kill or harm you if you violate its justice, regardless of any effort made by any agent to contradict or supplant them. It rules us no matter how hard we try to escape it through its being alone. It doesn't apply the punishment it merely allows it. And that's my, my vision of hell as well. Is God? I mean, you could argue that God is punishing you uh, in that he's allowing this to happen. But it's also, it's the consequence of not turning towards God and not becoming more like God so that you can enter into the throne room. And if you can't enter in the throne room, then you're on the outside. And if you're on the outside, then who you are, your 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 ego, your ego will be unbridled, it will be unfettered, and it will be unsatisfiable, and you will know it. And you won't be able to delude yourself that you are actually pursuing your ego in, 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 in a true sense of the term. And, and that will be, that's, that's the fire uh, that is the torture of hell that you face. The ego that you pursue is the perceptive potential of your peak selfness as an influence on whatever you perceive is. And I call this ego, finally, this is where I'm going to have to go back and change because make sure that this says ego all the way throughout until I get to this point. I call this ego the apex existential. And the apex existential is the is, was, and always will be of peak existentiality that God has placed within you as a stumbling stone or a cornerstone. And if you want to remove the language of God, then you could say that it is the peak of existentiality that your ego seeks to, to, to attain, if you want to use it that way. So for the non-believer, well, okay, good. I'm already thinking of it. <laughs> for the non-believer, you could think of the ego the apex ex existentiality within you as both emerging from the biofeedback system and being altered and defined by self's collection of memories it contains. And I'm going to tell you what the biofeedback system is right here. Well, the biofeedback system creates incentive to act based on the apex existentiality within you, but is also altered by it which is also altered by your collection of memories. You can sustain either heuristically or observationally and also alters your memories. And then I'm going to repeat this here to try to clarify this more. All three elements, the biofeedback system, memory, and apex existentiality are influenced by and influence one and the other. It's like the Trinity. Although... They are all distinct essences and yet one thing, the self, and yet not one or the other. Now, that's, that's the Trinity. But unlike the Trinity, they are not persons, agents, but near agentic. So you're not achieving that Trinitarian oneness that the Godhead can achieve. The self wants ultimately... And another, and I'll say this: uh, this really has to do with the the ability of the Trinity to both be entirely God and yet perceive uh, non selfness. In that each three is distinct. You don't have you don't have you have no non selfness within you. You need non selfness. The Godhead uh, 
I, I, I guess I'll, uh, I'll, 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 uh, I'll turn on the, uh, the Ficta and, uh, even, uh, well, I'll just fict is good enough. I'll just you know fict the the idea that God needs the other, or the non-self is I don't believe that's true. I believe that God prefers, well for whatever reason God has chosen to create additional non-selfness. He in and of himself he contains both the totality of himself as well as the capacity to experience non-selves with within him, in that in that mysterious. Uh, dialectical nature of of the trinity itself the self wants ultimately the reward of perceiving and i'm calling perceiving basically memory they are walking in the apex existential when the self possesses this perception the biofeedback system and this is where we're going to get a little bit more about what the biofeedback system is and i think some of you probably can understand it because it's it's been used in in psychology and well, I, I think, uh, various fields. So the biofeedback system releases chemicals, sends electric signals, etc., that reinforce in you a notion of success. And we describe these signals as emotions, feelings, instincts, compulsions. And in my faith, which is Christianity, as you could probably tell, this is the physiological and quantum expression of the spirit. And that is to say that the the, the physiological parameters that uh, produce the mechanisms by which the body speaks to the mind, but the mind itself exists within a, a, a quantumness uh, that you will then convert back to the physiological so that you can understand it at that level. In order to achieve this reward, uh, the self modifies the apex existential within to allow for plausible perceptions of success. And perception is memory with potential future. That is memory with potential future. Right, right in and of itself, memory is kind of a past. It's, it's loaded with past inference. And potential future, it, it is a memory that you can perceive using forward to equip you in in the life to come so without that potential future memory dies well as i say here memory without potential future dies there you go potential future requires plausible coexistentiality with the is that is not perceived to be the self if there were no is outside of self the self would construct it or die, and as I've used this phrase already, I call this the non-self, which covers all phenomena that enters into a memory form that is not correlated to the self or the perception of selfness. The process of phenomena becoming memory is a battle between the will to perceive, if you will, the will to build memory, and the need to perceive plausibly useful memory that allows you to go forward. So the will to perceive is, is the memory of what was and the potential of what's to come, and the need to perceive plausibly is much more rooted in, in the potential to come. This is much more future-oriented. So the will to perceive is, is framed within the past and the future, and the need to perceive plausibly is framed in in future endeavors. So in this section, what we have done here for the non-believer, uh, well, what we have done here is we have described essentially the, the beginning stages of how you develop your apex existentiality. You're calibrated initially by your feedback, by your biofeedback system. Uh, and from that initial calibration, and if you look in the chart here, you'll see that begins with the bio. The biofeedback system is the beginning of your engagement. You're beginning about ready to, to, to release into the world. And I just want to blow this up here for a second so I can show this to you. So you can see if you're looking at the upper left corner where it says framing of potential action, the biofeedback system is giving you a sense of, of of do this or not do this through your your emotions uh the the various uh level the various uh 
where is it here where I called this make sure I get this uh, harmonized up here emotions feelings instincts compulsions the things that compel you to action or to not take action this is your beginning now now you're entering into your your framing of potential action this is where it begins this is what compels you to act you have a pursuit of the apex existential which is initially defined by your biofeedback system offering you the rewards and penalties towards or away from action but as you enter into the world as you enter into the world then that's the biofeedback system is not going to continue to be the sole driver of your apex existentiality so let's get on to the next section here which is well there is no now only what was and what might so now I'm going to basically briefly settle the whole, well, I'm not going to settle it. I'm going to dismiss it. And the argument of the material, the ideal, do we make the world, does the world make us, is the material real, is the ideal real? Well, that's what I'm going to deal with here. As for the real, and I want to make sure I point this out too, there is no now, only what was and what might be. That is to me what perception is. Perception is not in the present and I'm in a sense I'm borrowing first from Bergson's idea of time which is that time is a ever shrinking diminishment of the potential past and future uh, and it's a process it's 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 not a point and for Whitehead Whitehead who said that reality is a verb and Whitehead described a process of perception that mostly operated within, uh, within a prehending of all that has come. He was, uh, the way that I understand him, it's, he was more rooted in, in the past and all of the past coming in, into to one frame so that you could perceive. And I'm not, I'm, I'm, borrowing somewhat from that but i'm adding the element that it is also prehending the potential future so it's prehension of both past and future that creates the the ever slivering dimension of what you might perceive you know it's an event it's a, as, as whitehead would call it perception it's an event it's it's also not a point it's an event that you're that you're processing and the event itself is gathering it's not getting bigger but it's gathering more and more pa it's prehending more and more past associations with it until it gets to the point where it can no longer be dynamic and then it disappears and the event could last at whatever the smallest amount of time and whatever the smallest amount of spaces that's where an event can exist and then there's a congress i believe he calls it a congress which is uh, what we really perceive is cong a congress of events uh, that collectively creates our perception of the world. And Whitehead was uh, an empiricist. Uh, well, no, not empiric. He was a he was an emergent naturalist. So he believed in the material, fundamentally defining the self, but that uh, we we can't understand that process. Well, we can't understand that by breaking down the material into atoms. It is an emergent thing, so we have to look at the at the holistic to get a better sense of, of who we are than breaking things down atomistically. So he was a non-reductionist naturalist, is, is, is how I understand him. So as for the realness of the non-self, it is irrelevant insofar as no life lives that has no perception of it, as life necessitates action, and action necessitates compulsion to act and compulsion to act as i am claiming comes from the pursuit of extending self outside of self in ways in other words entering into the non-self realm in ways that reinforce the self that the self wishes to be the apex existential that emerges first from the biofeedback system our dna has encoded in us and then faces revisions based on the memories we can contain, preserve within us, heuristically and observationally. 
and I can, I'm not necessarily going to try to find heuristically and observationally. I think most of you listening can someone understand, you know, heuristic learning is the learning that you learn by doing rather than mapping it all out in a detailed form and learning it in that way and practicing whatever. No, heuristically is just that uh, you just do it, and in the process of doing, you figure out at, a, at an unaware, non-observational level, your mind-body is figuring out the mechanics and processes through which this whatever it is that you're seeking to do is, is achieved, as opposed to observationally, where you are working in a highly self-aware, disciplined way to map out a process of action that helps you achieve whatever it is you're trying to achieve. I can never prove non-selfness is independent of selfness, but I cannot disprove non-selfness within me so long as I perceive I am. The I am of Descartes does more than just justify self. Should have said that. Just justify. <laughs> yes, because you know, just justify. I want to do that. So the I am of Descartes does more than justify self. It justifies self's perception of non-self, for it requires non-self to be. Yet, if it still falls short of proving non-self independent of self outside, of, yet it still falls short of proving non-self independent of self outside of self's perception of alone. In other words, I cannot prove to anyone else that the non-self is real. I can only prove to myself that it is. That's the limitation. Non-self is unavoidably true for anyone who experiences a sense of self, a perception of living. Still, the bridge between my perception of selfness and your perception of selfness is unbroachable. We we just we just we just can't reach into each other's heads and and see the selfness that is. So we can all, and, and even we, we ourselves, like I said, the self is not a point either. The self is a process. So we can't fully access the self, but we could certainly get far close. We can get to a patina of self. Uh, or I would rather say a palimpsest to self, and I think I used that word later on, a palimpsest to self where we can't access the palimpsest to self of others. So we can only act by faith, and that, and that is that we can never, we, we, we can prove that there is a non-self, but we can't prove that the non-self has agency, only that we perceive that something is acting independent of ourselves. But it doesn't necessarily mean that you have agency. It just means... That, that something that looks like you and sounds like you and acts like you is not me. That's the only thing that I can prove. We can plausibly perceive that non-selfness for the non-self is real, though we cannot confirm it. As I said, we cannot deny it within our own perception, for we cannot deny that we perceive a self that is a palimpsest, there you go, I said it, of the self we may actually almost be. The sun might not rise tomorrow. But I like my chances that it will. And this is, in a, in a sense, you go back to Hume, who Hume's uh, the, the, the cause and effect uh, relationship that uh, uh, John Locke was using to justify empiricism. That, uh, and John, I really like the way that, that John Locke uh, uses power. And power for John Locke is, is the, the result of, well, I call it the result of the exchange of action, which I'll get to later, but there's a correlation and a cause and effect and that you can, because of that, you can extrapolate uh, into the future that something will happen and Hume says, no, you can't. And I kind of agree with him that, that, that in, the, in, the, in the strictest sense of the term, no, you can't. But even though you can't, the sun might not rise tomorrow, but I like my chances that it will. So I will plan my potential future accordingly. Within hierarchies of plausibility, the sun will surely rise tomorrow, and the non-self will surely respond to my actions as a perception of non-selfness they must, en must engage with when I am before them. I say all this only to hopefully jettison the whole debate of the realness of non-selfness within my apex existential schema I am attempting to build altogether. I am not going to address the material or the ideal in terms of which is which is defining which. As a matter of fact, in my system, it's uh, it's again, it's a process. It's a process between the two. It's it's not a duality either. It's not dualism. It's more like when John Verveke 
is talking about the the idea of 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 being both contemplative and meditative and you get to that uh uh what do they call it the, the i forget the word it begins with a p but the, the 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 state the the state of wisdom where you are able to simultaneously exist within the hierarchy of of the highest order and the hierarchy if you will of the lowest order where you're looking deeply into the into the internality of the self while at the same hand how the self is fully connected to everything and everyone around it that uh that that's a process and it's uh and if, if you want to think about it the one end uh, the high end and that's i mean i don't know which one you you could kind of depends on how you look at it i think but you could say that the meditative is the material and the contemplative is the ideal uh and those two those two factors whether one is real or not real uh, i don't know but uh those two factors those those two they interplay with one another to create uh going back again even to whitehead if we're or we're looking at uh perception as being this uh prehending of 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 past and future and well, for, for me prehending past and future not just prehending past uh that uh the the potential to enter into uh a balance where the self can pursue the individuality of self through connecting to the wholeness and that is that is that that is where that is where perception uh, happens if non-selfness is not real then i am god playing make believe but even then i must be in some sense like the trinity the God that is many and yet one. In this case, three. The God is three. But anyway, the God that is many and yet one. For a God without non-selfness is not compelled to act and thus cannot live. But gods that are not one and have no compulsion, not necessity, merely compulsion, desire that is not existentially required to create outside of their own communities. And this is one of the reasons why I, I believe so strongly in 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 my particular God. If, you know, if you want to get to the Kalam cosmological argument, the nothing, something can't come from nothing. If the universe, if the universe has a beginning, and right now it looks pretty hard not to say that it isn't, that it doesn't. If the universe has a beginning, then it was created. And if it was created, it had to be created by something outside of itself, something that itself has no beginning. And that, that would be something like a God. But what kind of God would create? And the kind of God that would create would have to be a God that uh, both was, was total in God's self and also had an element of non-selfness within God. And this is, this is the nature of Godhead. So I'll go over this again. If non-selfness is not real, then I am playing make God that I am God playing make-believe but even then I must be in some sense like the Trinity and I have told you that even though I have these these three elements that are defining my apex existentiality I have memory I have the biofeedback system and the apex existential frame itself and all of those three interplay with one another and uh, they're, they're not distinct entities this isn't the mystery of the Trinity these are gradations of selfness these are not uh, the, the, the mystery in which uh, the three are distinct and yet one. You don't achieve that. You don't have non-selfness within you. For a God without non-selfness is not compelled to act because you need non-selfness to act. In other words, without non-selfness, you have no compulsion to act out and to fulfill anything. You, you'll just die. Without the non-self, you'll die. And I believe if you look at schizophrenics, I think uh, so some of the, well, some of my theory regarding the nature of schizophrenia is that the schizophrenic is when they're in that, when, they're, when, they, when they approach that state, uh, that they are no longer, they're either A, no longer able to, to enter into a potential apex existentiality, and so they invent non-selfness that they can enter into or they're they're not able to filter a range of potential apex existentialities and and thus they are they're overwhelmed with potential it's kind of like going back to lacan's uh 
notion of of the real so his reality is the imaginary and the ideal that they get together to cr produce reality and reality the way that i would view it i might not be getting it totally right reality is is the bounded real the filtered real so that you can act without being overwhelmed by infinite possibility the real is the infinitely possible so I'm going to go back and I'm going to read this part again and I'll make sure we got this down. If non-selfness is not real, then I am God playing make-believe. But even then, I must be in some sense like the Trinity, the God that is many and yet one. For a God without non-selfness is not compelled to act and thus cannot live. But gods that are not one have no compulsion and not necessity, merely compulsion. Uh, and this is where this is significantly where I where I I, uh, I, I, I I leave Leibniz and uh, uh, well certainly I leave Fichte and I leave uh, uh, Schillinger and Fichte and Schillinger are really important to well they're really important to creating this notion of of a dynamic Godhead that is evolving and I don't look at God as evolving. Uh, first off, God, you can't evolve when you are the is, was, and always will be in a timeless sense. There's evolving kind of, kind of implies a progress of time that God exists outside of. But uh, to to limit the Godhead to a sense that the Godhead needs us or needs anything diminishes his capacity, his perfection, and it diminishes the sovereignty of God, and it puts God on a leash. And when you put God on a leash then you no longer have an, an ideational frame that you can pin yourself on that won't compel you to take coercive action because ultimately it once again requires the perfection of humans in order for your apex existentiality to be uh, fulfilled and humans are incapable of perfection so you will have to lie and when you have to lie lies a form of coercion you lie to yourself and then you lie to others and then your enemies will use because your enemies know what your lies are and so they'll use your lies to go after your sheep and if they go after your sheep you're gonna have to kill them so so there you go i want to make sure that 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 is very important that i make that point here so I'll go back to this. It's If non-selfness is not real, then I am God playing make-believe. But even then, I must be in some sense like the Trinity, the God that is many and yet one. For a God without non-selfness is not compelled to act and thus cannot live. But gods that are not one have no compulsion, not necessity, merely compulsion, desire that is not existentially required. God does not need us. He doesn't need creation. He doesn't need you. He chose you of his own free volition his perfect volition to create outside of their own communities and i have no such notion within me of multiplicities of distinct agentic cells i have no non-selfness in me only of competing nested versions of the total self sense self i sense now i think the schizophrenic also going back to schizophrenic creating multiple personalities for instance multiple personalities is the self seeking to create non-selfness within because the self is identified that it can't enter into the non-selfness that it has so far perceived, but it never could achieve that. It can't. It can't achieve actual non-selfness. It has to lie to itself. If it is real, as I highly suspect it is, then my apex existential schema might just liberate you from the wannabe masters of this earth and prevent you from seeking to be the wannabe masters of others. For the non-believer, this is a path that will lead to moral constraints and compulsions, the creation of virtue. I got this from John Verveke too. Uh, virtue, the machine that allows us to function with non-cells in consensual exchange with no need to claim a Godhead as the creator of such moralities. Virtue. Virtue is, as John Verveke had, had said, and I don't know, maybe... I, I heard it from him, so that's why I'm citing him. Virtue is virtual. It's a virtual machine. That's what virtue is. It's a virtual machine. The virtual machine within you, it is the regulator and the generator. So what you need within you is something that regulates. And I can go back to Lacan's concept of the real, the real being in in infinite, and, and it gobbles you up. You need a regulator 
to limit the Rio, if you will. So the regulator, these are the, the rules, mores, standards, whatever you want to call these things that, that allow you to limit the, the potential perception that you might actually uh, uh, take possession of. At the same hand, you, you also need a generator, and that's the apex existentiality. The apex existentiality is, is what compels you to enter into the world. Your understanding of the limits of your apex existentiality is what enables you to limit your perceptive state so that you're not overwhelmed, and overcome, and destroyed by infinity. So, again, I'll go back here. For the non-believer, this is a path that will lead to moral constraints and compulsions, the creation of virtue, the machine that allows us to function with non-selves in consensual exchange with no need to claim a Godhead as the creator of such moralities. I'll put it another way. In other words, I am creating a non-theistic morality, but I am doing so by building schematics born from the underlying assumptions that God has placed eternity in into our hearts. The is, was, and always will be of existentiality from which our compulsion to act emerges. This is where I got the original thought that uh, we are pursuing the apex existential. The apex existential is the eternality within us. And the eternality, it gives us a sense that we might actually become God. Not that, well, I'll get into why that's not such a great idea, because you can't. You can't become God. And so, you have to come to an understanding of your own limitations. And you come to an understanding of your own limitations. First, by understanding you only act in interest of yourself. You are only capable of acting in the interest of yourself. And the second part is you're a horrible wretch of a human being. You are weak. You are pathetic. You are poor. You are incapable of achieving this apex existentiality within you, so you have to adopt, you have to diminish your apex existential pursuit so that you can continue to receive from your biofeedback system the joys, the happiness, whatever you want to call it, the, the emotions that you, that, you, that you cling to that gives you what, what you want. It's, it's the drugs. You're chasing after a drug, if you will, an existential drug, if you will. And so you can experience the perception of walking in the apex existential without having to take coercive action against others, which is good because at the end, you have no capacity to triumph overall. You will eventually be laid low. You need not believe in him to follow this path. You need only recognize, first of all, that you perceive your sense of self and therefore for you, non-self exists so you can't escape the non-self exists you have to come to terms with this you're not a lone ranger the non-self exists and it has powers external to you you've experienced it you see it you know it so you best come to terms with it if you hope as surely you do to live out what makes you feel good what makes you sense pleasure what makes you perceive you are engaged fully of your own volition with the non-selfness you perceive all that we can know is we are. From that, we can know, at least for ourselves, that non-selfness is. And now what I hope to show you is you have no power to achieve what your biofeedback system is compelling you to achieve, to be the apex existential in the fullest form. And I've already suggested this. You must modify your assumptions of apex existentiality to give your biofeedback system easier ways to reward you for pursuing it, for being it successfully. And you can only get there through following patterns of consensual exchange with the non-selfness around you, lest you become fooled by your own mind to continue to pursue, promote, and enable the few winners of coercive exchange that have dominated our human experience since civilization rose. As a matter of fact, it's where civilization rose, I believe. And I think it's why God, God speaks to Abraham. God comes to speak to Abraham, and, uh, and he, he lays the groundwork for, for uh, a, a royal family, if you will. That's how I view Israel. It was a royal family he was creating amongst humans. And he enters into this 
this discourse with Abraham after this long silence between Noah and Abraham, because this is Abraham emerges somewhere roughly around 2000, 2100, somewhere around BC. It's shortly after uh, Sargon of Akkad has created the first empire. Well, we've seen the first real fruition of a civilization where the priest king has fully emerged. The priest king is the heart of the earth that rules through death. And this is where God decides to start to have the discourse with humanity once again, once we have developed this pattern, this civilizing pattern. So you must modify your assumptions of apex existentiality to give your biofeedback system easier ways to reward you for pursuing it, for being it successfully, and you can only get there through following your patterns of consensual exchange with the non-selfness around you, lest you become fooled by your own mind to continue to pursue, promote, and enable the few winners, of course, of exchange that have dominated our human experience and civilization roles. And they do this by, in fact, promoting the habits of action that allow you to diminish yourself and graft your apex existentiality onto their apex existentiality, even though their apex existentiality that you imagine brings you to the heights is a lie. It's, they're not capable of achieving it. They have to lie to you, and you have to want to be lied to, and you have to want to pursue the enforcement of protecting those lies from your enemies in order for you to continue to pursue this apex, apex existentiality and thus civilization. You will, in fact, continue to be a slave of the earth. You will never be free. You will always be owned by masters that are even more ruthless, coercive than you. If you have baseball empowering governance, baseball players that are excellent at baseball playing They'll be your leaders. If you have coercive empowering governance, then coercive governance players that are excellent at coercion will be your leaders. That's why you have men and women who had the helm of power that were willing to command that human beings who are only guilty of violating their apex existential lies should be murdered. And your biofeedback system will never offer you the reward that authentic consensual achievement of apex existentiality can offer you. In other words, if you want the really good drugs, <laughs> internal drugs, so to speak, pull down your vanity so that the authentic apex existential can rise in full humility. So to do this, the first step will be to face the nature of your reality of power, which is, in essence, you have very little, at least compared to what you mostly perceive that you do, largely through the moral constructs you've invented and or adopted that allow you to be diminished in power without perceiving that you are. Now, the purpose of apex existentialism is to bring people face to face with the reality of their own diminished and largely powerless egos through reframing the description of reality in language that is stripped of the same types of appeals to acceptable constraint that perpetuates the model of master ego as a means of human organizing, which is the fundamental guiding principle of human organizing that created what we call civilization today. The notion of self-sacrifice, this is one of the most powerful tools in their toolbox and one that must be completely crushed if you hope to face the palimpsest of your perhaps true self. The best that we could hope for as self is a moving target with many selves in competition for the throne. This is why I started off this whole presentation here. Make sure I can. So this is why I started off this pr presentation here with these startling statements. You are compelled to take action that benefits you and you alone. All notions of altruism and, altruism and self-sacrifice are myths. These are the vehicles of power, which I'm going to get into later, that the, 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 coercive, the, the champions of coercion have created that, that, that encourage human beings to be willing to die for their masters and to kill others for their masters. And so it is essential that you dispense with this delusion that you don't act other than in interest of yourself. So, 
as the civilizing pattern of apex existentiality creates abilities for the biofeedback system to offer you a reward for pursuing that which cannot be achieved by creating vicarious and lesser versions of ex apex existentiality you can perceive you are walking in, so too does my apex existential schema, and that schema, and this is not set in stone, so I'm probably going to tweak this. This is probably not the, the final form, but that's the schema. That's what it looks like. This right here, you're looking at the biofeedback system, uh, which uh, then is, is forming the apex existentiality. And the apex existentiality is your beginning of framing of potential action that allows you to limit the infinite real so that you can actually enter into it without being overwhelmed. That's relevance realization, which is a phrase that I'm borrowing also from John Verveke. That's what a enables you to, to, to focus on the perception, to, to, to begin to cling on to that perception, and calibrate it. So you're calibrating it, and then once you've that, that's the process of uh, even if, uh, you know, I really, really loved how John Verveke describes the process of uh, going in and out as far as transparency and... Uh, uh, what, what do you call it, uh, uh, opalescence, so the the transparency, opaqueness, opaqueness, that's what he is. Um, so the transparency is when you're, you're entering, you're, you're entering into the frame, and you're entering into the frame through a process of you have your eyes, if you're using your hands, then you have the awareness of your hands, your hands are feeling, they're, 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 they're clasping at and engaging and being able to finally clasp close in on the object that in this case if there's an object that you wish to hold and then there is the opaqueness where you're entering outside of the frames of perception so that you can observe the perceptive frames themselves that's the calibration process and now you're able to take that that enables you to take the action then there is an action exchange and after the action exchange then you have where you, that's where the adjustments start to take place and, uh, well, I won't get into that right now, but uh, that, that, that is how you enter into it. So, as the civilizing patterns of apex existentiality creates abilities for the biofeedback system to offer you a reward for pursuing that which cannot be achieved by creating... Now, remember, I'm talking about the civilizing patterns here. These are the bad things. These are the ones that make you murderers uh, and murder enablers. So as this, this is the heart of the earth ruling. This is the stone heart or the heart of the earth, whatever you want to call it. As a civilizing pattern of apex existentiality creates abilities for the biofeedback system to offer you a reward for pursuing that which cannot be achieved by creating vicarious and lesser versions of apex existentiality you could perceive you are walking in, so too does my apex existential schema offer the same techniques but in radically different frames and I'm calling them right now, I'll call it loosely, even even though I don't think we can ever get to true authenticity. So when I use the word authentic, I mean approaching, pursuing authenticity, even though you never can achieve it. So, But in radically different frames, authentic frames, not built on deception, but something in pursuit of plausible understanding and then Knowing, and I think I repeat it later, but I'm going to say it right here. Understanding is the plan. Knowing is executing the plan. Wisdom is what gives you the inspiration, uh, the, the purpose, inspiration for the plan itself. Understanding is, is mapping out wisdom, and knowing is living out wisdom through understanding the, the plan that enables you to live out wisdom. The difference between the apex existential model, which I call action bots of the methodology that starts by asking why do humans act, this is what I'm going to describe here, the apex existential model, and the civilizing model is that one does so through deception so that you are, so you are participating in your own coercion at the benefit of coercive agents, the civilizing, that's obviously the civilizing pattern right there. While the other, action batsa, which means base of action, offers something approaching an authentic reflection of what is without denying the ability to continue to receive the life essential rewards our biofeedback system offers us when we perceive we are walking in apex existentiality. So with action batsa, base of action, you're asking yourself, 
In this case, we're asking specifically, why do I act? It's, it's taking stewardship over why do I act and trying to authentically, remember authenticity is not an end goal, it's a pursuit because you can never get to true authenticity, authentically pursuing an understanding of why I act, which we begins with these two frames. The first frame is that I do not act outside of my own interest, and two, I am a diminished person a, uh, who is not capable of achieving what is within me, and well, it's really three things. It's it's an understanding that you are, you act only in your best interest, and that you have a, a diminished capacity to act uh, in in pursuit of what compels you to act in the first place, which is a pursuit of the apex existential. So, I believe that my schema will offer you greater biofeedback rewards with an expectation of less apex existentiality than the civilizing model could ever afford you and without ever having I won't say ever because I'm not an absolutist so I'm not I'm not a purist and I don't believe that uh, we can ever achieve a pure sense of uh, of of consensual exchange even parent child relationships there's an element of coercion that must take place when it comes to parent child relationships because the child is not of a volitional state to be able to act in an independent sense that would not potentially bring great harm to the child and so you have a stewardship over your child that requires a level of of coercive uh exchange if you will so i'm not a i don't want to suggest that i'm i'm painting you towards a pure in any way in any way shape or form i i'm not giving to uh purism to puritanicalism to certainty in general I say in general because I do have some certainties, but very few, or, or absolutes in general. And again, I do have some absolutes, but very few. So the lesser expect ex expectational apex existentiality within my schema, the lesser expectational apex existentiality, that is you are, you are pursuing something which is far lesser than what you are able to pursue by grafting yourself onto the Democrat Party or Donald Trump. Something significantly less than that, but significantly more plausibly achievable, and thus your body will give you great reward as if you are achieving great things, as if you are achieving what, what they promise you without having to pursue what they promise you because what they promise you is a lie. And so you have to be coercive. One requires nervousness that your lies will be exposed. One is free from the constant diminishment of apex existentiality that comes through concealing lies and where are we at here lost my place for a second here one requires nervous okay one is free from the constant diminishment of apex existentiality that comes through concealing lies and being at risk of being exposed as the fraud you almost always are and if you were walking in the present civilizing apex existential frames i can assure you you're a fraud Nietzsche believed in the will to power. And while his metaphysical father, Schopenhauer, sought to escape it by, well, I, I would say, or I would argue like the Buddhist, simply subverting the ego, something that is impossible without leading to death, a result the uh, Buddhists are, are, are almost not shout, sh shy about. Now, so Schopenhauer sought to escape the, whole, the, the will to power. And the will to power is essentially... This is your pursuit of the apex existential, although Nietzsche didn't use that phrase. I do not seek to subvert your ego, but to help you come to terms with its wish and the reality of power that necess necessarily, unavoidably constrains it. I seek to get you to embrace the reality of power so that you might more authentically reach your apex existential potential which will be a diminished expectation of what the civilizing pattern offers, but with a far greater authentic, again, authentic, of, again, that's a process. It's not ever a, 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 a complete accomplishment, but with a far greater authentic potential of becoming at the highest levels the apex existentialities we unevenly possess. And by that, I mean we as individuals. We have uneven apex existentialities within us. And you can go to the parable of the talents for an understanding of this uneven apex existentiality and what it is that 
within our Christian frame that the Godhead is looking for. Your apex existentiality within you is the potential to reflect God's glory and how you per how you reflect God's glory will be your your accounting at the end is according to the measure by which you have been given in the first place. So if you have one talent and you come back with one talent, that's bad. If you have well, if you have one talent and you come back with five talents, that's great. If you have ten talents and you come back with five talents, that's bad. In other words, you can live out the imaginative constructs of a grand apex existentiality that produces in the reality of power a slave that is controlled almost wholly by the world around you, where the true apex existential within you is a puppy on a leash held by your master. Or you can accept the true nature of your apex existentiality, but you are a wretch like me, and thus live out a free life, bound by consensual limitations, not coercive ones. And that is not an absolute, that is a, that is a, that is a guide where your authentic apex existentiality far surpasses the authentic apex existential maximum contained within a system of deceit, a system of coercion that has produced war after war in satisfaction of the most ruthless of us all, so that humanity is led by killers and enabled by those who vicariously live through them, hoping one day they might get their turn at doing to others what their real masters are doing, not only to their perceived enemies, the others that cannot be the we, but to the selves as well that make such murder possible. And you are just hoping one day to get your turn at killing those wicked others that are getting in the, in the way of you being able to fully live out your vicarious apex existentiality. Now, if you'd like to take a shortcut, then submit yourself to the Lord and follow the lived out patterns of Christ when he walked among us and gave us a new command to love one another as he loved us. But that pattern only works when you authentically believe which you cannot approach until you recognize your wretchedness and the need for his salvation, which is the fear of the Lord, which is the beginning of wisdom. And uh, then that moves into the love of and by and for the Lord. And that is the wisdom becoming understanding. That's how you can start to make your plans, your patterns, that then, the, the, and that's, the, that's the plan, and then that moves into knowledge, the doing. To be a master in his scheme, you must be a slave to the ones you lead. That's the key. To be a master in his scheme, you must be a slave to the ones you lead, which keeps the churn of real power from coalescing at the top, eliminating the necessity of coercion as a means of achieving apex existentiality. The is, was, and always will be in us all the very image of God. And then that will take us to this right here. And this right here is, uh, in essence, it's a flowchart. I'm going to go over it very briefly, and I'm not going to get into all the details because that'll be a, a second part where... I think I'm going to try to write a script out for that in, in relation to this because there's some things that I'm going to have to describe here. Like I haven't even described power to you, or, or what power is, uh, how I define power, and I'll say it right now. Power is the perceived ability to influence action and the perceived result of the exchange of action. And that last part is kind of a Lockean definition there. Uh, well, somewhat modified Lockean definition, and I added it because of John Locke, so I'll, I'll cite my forces. The first part is the part that I originally had, and I added the second part. So what happens is you have the biofeedback system that has calibrated your potential apex existentiality and will reward you accordingly. And uh, that is what compels you to act. And the framing of potential action begins here, and then you enter into... This, this is the vehicle of power. You have to recognize something that you can enter into. And the meaning project, they call this, this is the meaning crisis. This is, I identify meaning as the vehicle of power. Although, uh, I mean, vehicle of power, it's, it's any, it's, it's, it's habit of action. And, and there's a various, various forms of, of, well, there's various, various human tooling, if you will, that provides this type of, habit of action there's religion there's philosophy there's superstition there's there's a there's 
baseball baseball rules. There's uh, concepts of father, mother, whatever. There's there's a multiplicity of ideational frames that allow you to create a habit of action that is interactable with the non-self. And this is the key. The vehicle of power allows you to enter into the non-self frame. So once you identify a vehicle of power, what John Verbeke calls relevance realization, it's really, it's not. I mean, I like the phrase, so I'm keeping it here. It's certainly within my frame, but it's really, the relevance realization is identifying a vehicle of power that you can enter into. Then there is the calibration, the final calibration. You take the action, there is the action exchange, and then there is a Vehicle of power calibration. So you'll make an adjustment uh, of uh, your assumption of the usefulness or non-usefulness of the vehicle of power according to the perceived result of action exchange. And then that goes to an apex existential recalibration because now you have a different understanding of what non-self is, your relationship to non-self. Now you have to recalibrate your apex existentiality. So this is the outside world affecting the inside world, if you will. This is the external affecting the internal. And you'll also see here the internal affects the external. It, it affects the very, very notion of, 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 of the need, the quote unquote need for perception in the first place. So it's and, and, and you know, it's always the same case so many times. Who's zooming whom? The push me, pull me. Who's pushing? Who's pulling? And, it, you know, that that's a mystery that I'm not going to try to resolve. So. You get the apex existential recalibration, and then that now then affects your biofeedback system. So that is recalibrated so that it can offer you the drugs because it wants to give you the good drugs. So that it can offer you the drugs to re possibly achieve the apex existentiality. And within that, you see the apex existentialism here. We have the physiological, the genetic, and the ideational. These are the three the, there, there are three states of existentiality. The physiological is the, I'll say the material for lack of a better term, but it's really, that's not exactly uh, fully ideal phraseology there. The genetic, and I may change this word genetic yet because I'm still not fully comfortable with it, but I may change it to my brother uh, Bill gave me the idea of possibly calling it reproductive. But for now, I'm going to go with genetic. And genetic isn't 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 necessarily the physiological, the DNA, you know, having kids. There's there's you can have ideational genetic and you can have physiological genetic, uh, and then there is the ideational. And the ideational, this is where philosophy, art, religion, all those things, where those 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 abstract internal concepts, uh, and and abstract internal concepts that we can perceive, enable us to in interact with the non-self and what happens is within this apex existentialism through this process of calibration and recalibration what you end up with is you have these different paths here you have the direct you have the vicarious complete the vicarious pursuit you have the certain and the uncertain so in the direct the direct and the certain if you look at the dark green square where the direct and the certain overlap, what you end up with is these are where the killers reside. These are where the Hitlers, the Mussolinis, and all the rest, all, all your 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 top level political leaders. These aren't the only ones, but this is the greatest example. So this this is where they reside. They have a they have been able to perceive in this process, this calibration, recalibration process, no diminishment. They do not perceive a limitation on their capacity to continue to pursue what they imagine is the height of apex existentiality. And then there is now the vicarious. Now, by the way, you see the direct here. You have the direct, which can be certain, and you have the direct, which can be uncertain. So this is a pursuit of, 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 of becoming uh, an apex existentiality that you're you're not well that you you don't you you are you are rested in an in in an un an i won't say undefined but fully defined capacity and then there is the vicarious complete now the vicarious complete is this is where your goal 
is to ultimately achieve the apex extensional to bring it to fruition. And you can have the vicarious complete, which is certain. The vicarious complete, complete which is certain. This is where most political activists reside. They, 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 they mostly reside in here. The vicarious complete and certain. They're given over to murder their neighbors because they have a hope of achieving the apex existentiality, even if it's through their masters, in the here and now. And then <laughs> there is the vicarious pursuit. And the vicarious pursuit is you are not hoping for a completion, but you're still doing uh, resting in certainty. So there's still some coercion that's going to take place all along here, all along the green line. Coercion is a necessary preserver of your lies. Then you get over here to the uncertain. Now you're starting to get less and less coercion as 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 a necessity to continue to pursue your apex existentiality. But you still require some. So, for instance, when you get to the uncertain direct, well, these the again, you're talking about an unobtainable. You cannot directly be, even in an uncertain sense, the apex existential. So you will have to lie. You will have to deceive. And if you're vicarious complete, if you're over here in the uncertain, where you're willing to 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 concede that you don't have the finite definitive uh, pattern of, of what exactly the apex existential is, you're still pursuing a completeness, which is a lie. You can't achieve that, so you will have to lie to yourself, and coercion will reign, although not as strongly. Like, it really, if you look at it, it really goes, whether it goes down or up, it is up here, the, the, up here is the highest level, the highest requirement for coercion. And down here, we get to finally vicarious pursuit and vicarious pursuit and uh, uncertain. Vicarious pursuit and uncertain. This is where the Christian who has, the, the Christian, and I'll call him the true Christian, the Christian who has made God the sovereign, the unobtainable, unknowable not not I mean we, we can know many we can know the palimpsest of god which is about all we have access to uh but we cannot know the fullness of god so we 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 do not claim a certainty when it comes to who god is and we do not believe that we can bring to fruition in the here and now our 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 becoming vicariously uh like him that is the least amount of coercion and again, I'm not a purist, so I don't believe that coercion is ever completely out of the table. But in essence, you are fundamentally consensually minded. And then you get to the vehicle of power here and how that breaks down. And you have the perception. And perception is what is willed and the reality of power. And what is willed is what you wish to perceive, the memories that you wish to build that reinforce your sense of apex existentiality. And the reality of power is the part of perception that diminishes your capacity to perceive your apex existentiality. And then you have the self and the non-self. So you have the, the perception of yourself and the perception of the non-self. And then you have the uh, nested within the self, you have the observed and the heuristic. The observed is your capacity to to form thoughts that you're aware of and to plan in a, in a in an aware sense, as opposed to the heuristic self, where most of your action, most of your understanding resides, is in the in the heuristic. Uh, and it and the heuristic is the part of self that acts be you know you call it the unconscious but i don't like that word i really and i don't like conscious either this is really you could say conscious and unconscious but i don't like those words i i prefer observed and heuristic and then you get over here to the non-self and you get the tribal non-self and the other non-self the tribal non-self now this isn't limited to humans non-self is all perception that is not perceived as being you and so you can for instance have a tribal affiliation with a cup of water or an other affiliation. The tribal affiliation is that which you can enter into or that which can enter into you. And the other is that which you cannot enter into and you cannot enter in, and uh, it cannot enter into you. It becomes an existential threat to your well-being. It's the place where you can justify, while still pursuing the apex existential, the use of coercion to achieve your apex existentiality. And... Uh, if we look over here, you see we have understanding mind, wisdom heart, knowledge, spirit action. I'll explain this briefly, and then I think we're done here. Now, this all is 
a work in progress. Everything that I'm saying here is a work in progress, but I'm presenting it for, for feedback, critique, whatever, see if I can get a greater understanding from anybody who might uh, might perceive this. So this understanding, mind, wisdom, heart, knowledge, spirit, action. So first of all, let me talk about it. I, this comes from my understanding, and I got a lot of my uh, understanding from uh, Matthew uh, uh, P- uh, Pichot, and uh, what's the name? Mash- Ma- Ma- Matthew Matthew Peugeot. Let me see if I can. Oh man, uh, the the. Uh. Here we go. Let's see. Let's get this. Uh, so this Matthew Peugeot book here, uh, which is the language of creation, cosmic symbolism in Genesis. And uh, what I learned from that book, which which plums with my reading of Scripture like significantly, and it's really affected even the way I read Scripture and understand it, that there is there is heaven, there is the world, and there is the earth. Heaven is wisdom. This is where the wisdom of God comes from. The wisdom of God comes from heaven, if you will. And then wisdom comes down upon you, and it enters into the the, the earth your earth. The earth is, in essence, you could say, well, I'm saying the earth is the mind here. So the mind is the earth. So it enters into understanding. And understanding is what enables you to make the plan of action. And the plan of action is what enables you to to know. Knowledge is spirit or action. So when I, 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 I pointed out when Christ died, for instance, it said he gave up his spirit, small uh, spirit. Spirit is that which animates, is that which enables you to manifest wisdom through understanding. Wisdom comes through the heart. So wisdom comes through the Holy Spirit through the heart. And that is uh, what enables you to convert God's wisdom to understanding that you can process within your physiological and quantum self. And when you process that, then that becomes knowledge. Now, when you don't have God, when you, when you don't have, and I'll say if you don't have a, an apex, a vicarious apex existentiality to into, enter into that is external to the self, then you end up really just, you, you start off, you, you derive your, your quote-unquote wisdom actually comes from the earth. It it just it starts right here, in the earth, and 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 there's no there's no wisdom from above happening, and that's when you have to start to lie and take course of action uh, against your neighbors because your your neighbors are going to know you're lying and they're going to compete with you. So then finally, knowledge knowledge is 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 what executes you what what animates your body. So if you look in here, you see understanding mind. This is what I'm calling. Uh, this is all subject to change. I'm still not quite sure that I like how I've done this here, but I'm just going to try to walk it out here uh, just just for the exercise alone. Understanding the mind, this is this is your biofeedback system. It's, it, you know, your biofeedback system, that's what you, you experience, your emotions and all that comes in there. Uh, and then uh, your apex existentialism, this is in your heart. God has placed eternity in your heart, and you have the stone heart, which turns that eternity upside down if you will, and then you have the heart of flesh, which, which is where the Holy Spirit resides. And for the non-believer, uh, the, the heart could be just be your, your, your metaphorical capacity to understand. Uh, uh, but anyway. And then finally, you get right here, this is the vehicle of power. Vehicle of power, this is, how, this is the manifestation. This is where action takes place. It's through the vehicles of power. This is the meaning code, the meaning or the meaning project. Uh, meaning code is a, a YouTube channel. You should sc- subscribe to that if you haven't. Uh, the meaning project. Uh, their crisis. The meaning crisis. It's not a meaning crisis. It's a. It's a. It's a. <laughs> well, it's a. I'll say it's an apex existential crisis, or it's an action, uh, a, a plausible action crisis in that, and that uh, the vehicles of power that are currently being offered to human beings are becoming increasingly less and less plausible because they're well they're becoming more and more framed in direct and certain claims by our masters and our masters are clamping down on dissent even as we speak because of course they're lying because nobody can offer the direct and certain apex existentiality 
and more and more human beings are being turned into others by the very myopic frame of the current vehicles of power that our masters are are hoisting upon us in America, for instance, the prevailing vehicle of power that our masters are seeking to execute over us, what do you call it, uh, critical race theory, social justice, whatever the multiplicity of names that you want to call it. It's, uh, I mean, it's an essentially, it's an, uh, it's, 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 it's an offer to an increasingly small number of tribe members that they can achieve the end of evil in the here and now and everybody will be able to maximally experience their apex existentiality because they'll no longer have evil competition. That's the promise, and, well, that's a lie. And uh, that's the vehicle of power that is, that is ruling us, and it comes from this apex existential claim. I think that's uh, that's about all I'm going to do here. And hopefully, if you guys see this, whoever might actually see this, the, you'll develop some understanding of what it is that I'm trying to produce. And as such, then you will be able to offer critique and I can figure out what's what with what. If I'm on to something or if I'm not. I have been combing over philosophers rather intensely uh, like never before in my life. And you know, I've even surpassed what I did in my 20s when I was very interested in philosopher's language theory, but really more from an aesthetic sense than anything else. It's really how I, how I read them and how I sought to utilize the knowledge that I gained from studying them. But be that as it may, I've even surpassed that period of time in, in a level of intensity because I'm trying to figure out if my ideas are Indeed, as I, I believe that there's a novelty to my thoughts, which may or may not be true. So comment down below if that's true. And uh, I thank you all for joining me. This is Paul Gordon Collier, and I have been your wonderful... I'm going to... Place, that's my... Ah, that's a scene for the show that I do for the Freedomist, but... Uh, let me move you up here and say, say goodbye... There you go. Okay, that's good enough. Okay, I'll do that. All right. So I am Paul Gordon Collier, and uh, I thank you for uh, paying attention to this video, if indeed you have. And I say, well, God bless.